Hi there, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. Do I always say welcome to Don't Miss This? Yeah, always. Oh, got confused after Truly? five <laughs> years <laughs> of doing this, I forgot. <laughs> um, then you usually say, if you're new with us, we've been studying Come Follow Me. Right now we're going through the New Testament. Okay, we're switching jobs today. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that for you. This is a scripture study podcast. And we are in the New Testament, the book of John. You're really excited today. We're John 2 through 4 because the stories are super rad, but you don't have to flip-flop around all the books yes. today, which is really rad. So nice. John's like one of the, we said this when we introduced John, um, most unique of all the gospel writers. So sometimes some of his stories aren't found anywhere else, including all the ones that we're doing today. They're yeah. unique. Uh, to this book. You can't yeah. find them in Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. And they're um, some of our most favorites. So you have like, you can look forward to every segment today. Um, if you're new with this, we should tell them you'll find five segments in every lesson. You can either watch them all at once the whole way through for about an hour is what we try and shoot for. But sometimes we just get really excited about what we're teaching and then it's longer than an hour. Um, but five segments. So if you wanted to watch one Monday, one Tuesday, one Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you could, or you can watch the whole entire episode at one time, however yeah. you want. And we kind of keep track of it on the board behind us. If you're watching, um, if you're listening, you'll hear us introduce a new segment and then that will be another, hopefully 10 minute segment. Yeah, little pause thing that you can do. All right. We're calling today the entire thing, John two through four, see the kingdom. This is something that, um, Jesus is going to say to Nicodemus, he's somebody that we're going to meet in just a minute. And he uses that phrase, which is really intriguing because we usually talk about build the kingdom, seek the kingdom. And it's interesting that Jesus will say to Nicodemus, you can actually see the kingdom. And obviously he's not going to, like if you say see the kingdom, I think, oh, you, you went to visit that castle in Germany or something. Mm. And you saw the castles and everything like that. And Jesus, these stories really show us what the kingdom looks like and how someone can see it in their own life, in yeah, their own and an ordinary experiences. Experience. Yeah. Um, the, the whole book of John, like all, you know, is this big kind of arc story. You have to remember he kind of wrote the whole thing as a beginning to end story. And at the end of chapter one, he says, Jesus says to Nathaniel, remember he met him underneath the fig tree, told him, I saw you. And Nathaniel was so like, that's amazing. And then Jesus gave him this promise. And he said, um, because I said unto you, I saw you under the fig tree, believest thou? Mm -hmm. He's like, you, you thought that was good. He says, buckle up, Nathaniel, thou shalt see greater things than these. And it seems to kind of be a theme of John where he's just like, let me show like, okay. It's almost like the end of one. You're like, what are they going to be? Yeah. You what's going to happen? What are you going to show us? Which makes John two kind of funny because it ends with this, like rolling out the red carpet to like, <laughs> you are going to see some amazing things. You turn the page chapter two and it's like, once there was a wedding, you know, and you're yes. kind of like, what? Wait a second. So this first segment that we're jumping into, we're calling a thrift shop miracle. And it's because it happens in the most ordinary backroom place with like normal home stuff. I, I wish you to tell the story and then it'll kind of yes. make sense. But John too, and it's interesting that at the end of the story, I'm going to just tell you, um, it's just spoiler, a spoiler alert. Yeah. Okay. At the end of the story, John's going to say in verse 12, 11, this, the beginning of miracles. Like it was so awesome. Like you would want, like, you know, Nathaniel, you'll see greater things than these. Turn the page and you're like, and then he raised a whole city from the dead, you know, <laughs> or like something like really, really cool and yeah, big. Because if this is going to be your calling card, right. Your then chance it should to be, show off. Yeah. What, you should you know, lead out with your very best thing. Yeah. Who what is it? is Jesus after all? Yeah. You know, this will be the sign. John's going to call it the sign, you know? This is the sign of who he is. And so that would be super intriguing to think about. Also as a teacher, to think about that, you're just like, okay, if this is the first miracle, if this is the calling card, if this is the expression of who he is, what do you learn from this story about who he is? That would yeah. be a really rad question to ask a class as they look through this. So 
Here we're at this normal wedding and it's up in the Galilee. You find out in verse one. So you should know the Galilee is like the farm country. This is the backwoods. It's not Jerusalem. It's not the capital. It's not like the prestigious place. It's kind of the forgotten part, you know, of the country. And they're at this wedding and they ran out of wine at the wedding. Now it's a bigger deal back then than it would be today to run out of, you know, the cream puffs from Costco on the table or something (laughs) like that. It would have been really disgraceful and stuff like that. But in context of the world's problems, we have Rome (laughs) threatening us, you know, to run out of wine at a wedding is, you know, it is what it is. They run out and Jesus's mom is there at this wedding and she comes to Jesus and she says, they, they ran out of wine. And he says, um, okay, well, you know, What do you want me to do about that? You know, almost this like, there's really clever language there um, where he's talking to her. And then she says this best line. She doesn't even answer that question. (laughs) And she turns to the servants and gives some of the best advice in the Bible, maybe in verse five, whatever he says to you, do it. Um, And so they have these, it says in verse six, six huge water pots. We actually have a picture of them because we want you to get an idea. If you go to Cana in Israel, you can see they have these old water pots still, some of them still preserved. And you can kind of get an idea of how big they are. And it will tell you right there that they hold um, two to three firkins a piece. And you might want to put a little note that a firkin is 20 to 30 gallons. So there's six water pots. They hold 40 to 90 gallons per piece. You can do the math. I just can't do that right now for you. (laughs) 20 to 30 Mm. each times six would be 120. Or 180. Or 180. Yeah. Or double that, right? Or whatever. Like just like so much water. And they, this part's so cute in seven, they fill them all the way up to the brim. Mm. These water pots. Now, these water pots. Like, I love this picture because it just sh- they're just stone pots. There's nothing magnificent about them. They're not decorated. They usually were used, it says in here, for the purifying of the Jews. So this yeah, is... The, that's in the in, footnote, yeah, right? Um, in that verse 6. Yeah, it tells in you. verse 6 in the footnote. So it means that it. It, so water wasn't drinking water. So you didn't really care like how super clean they were or anything like that. They were just used for washing of your hands and washing of your feet. And, and everything. probably right when you came in the right. back door. It's, so it feels like they're just like in the corner, right. like the mud room. Right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Isn't yes. that what you feel like? <laughs> right. And so then she says, that, you know, fill them up to the brim, he says. And they do. They fill them all the way up to the brim. And then um, they take out he says, now take the wine out and take it to the governor of the feast, the master of ceremony. So when it kind of is the DJ or whatever, running the whole mm-hmm. wedding. And they took it to him and he takes a sip of it in verse nine. And he says, pause, pause, give me the microphone. Everybody, normally what you do at a wedding, I've done a lot of these, it's my job. Normally what you do at a wedding is you save the really, you do the really, really good wine at the beginning. Um, because it's right when people get there, they're super excited. And then when they've danced and they've drunk too much, then you bring out the Walmart wine at the end because people don't even notice anymore, <laughs> you know? And they'll, you know, and he says, but these people, oh my word, verse 10, they kept the good wine until now. They saved the very, very best for last. Verse 11, that's the beginning of miracles of Jesus. Nathaniel, buckle up. You're going to see some amazing things things that are happening. And so if you pause and you look back, it's kind of cool to take a look at this miracle and say like, okay, what is it that I'm learning about who he is? And one thing we should add is I love when you were like, uh, like looking at the world problems, this is not a very big deal, but you have not had a daughter married yet. Yeah. And you have not lived with the wife or the mom of that daughter getting married and i will tell you on that day it won't matter what is going on in the world because everything that day is the most important thing that is just what happens and so i a little bit love that there is a woman somewhere in this story a mom of that daughter who is like uh this is a crisis Someone has to fix this situation. You know, you just love that he's like, I know about moms on wedding days. Yeah, which is really, really cool. And if you're going to say, what what do we learn about Jesus from the story? 
that could not be excluded from it because you're like, he's like, yes, I know what's happening on a macro level on, in this world. Yeah. But I also know what's happening in your world. And I know what's really important to you yes. in, in the world that you're, you're living in. And I like what you wrote in the devotional book about this. I'm going to steal your lines. I okay. hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, you said, uh, you're like, I find it noteworthy that he used what was already in the home for the miracle. Six water pots, late water, a ladle to draw with. It was just a few moments, a few people, a few pots in the back workroom. But what came from those few moments was the finest of wine. And that to me is really neat to think about this miracle that happens in the back room, that it happens with the forgotten water pots, that it happens only with a couple of people. And what went from this kind of ordinary, kind of not the best water, into the very finest of wine. You're like, wait, that is what Jesus yes. came to do. Yes. Right? Um, which is why we kind of call it that thrift shop miracle. Yeah, and I love the thought of that thrift shop idea because you think about those water pots were set aside. They were like unimportant. They were, you might not even notice them, you know? Yeah. If you were to like walk into the home, it's the thing that would be like, I don't know just not important. And yet all of a sudden on this night, it becomes so important to the story. And it makes me think of a time in my life, many, many years ago, when we were very first married and we were so poor. And I can remember having Caleb in the car, in a car seat, and he would have just been so tiny. And we were driving to my mom's house. And as we were driving there, I saw someone had cleaned out their whole garage. And they had brought out all the junk from the garage. And in the pile was this tandem bike. When I grew up, we had a tandem bike and it was some of my best summer memories. Memories was this green tandem bike that we would ride all the time. And so I was immediately drawn to it, but like it had no tires on it. The chains were off, the whole handlebar and the braking system was like messed up and tangled in itself. And I can remember driving Caleb to my mom's house and taking him inside and then walking down the street to that neighbor's house and pulling that bike out of their garbage and dragging it down the street. And it was heavy, it was so heavy. <laughs> and putting it right on my mom's front lawn and then I called Greg and I was like, bring the van home from work with you. And so he brought the van home from work and then he got there and as soon as he saw it, he was like, we are not taking that. No, no, we're not taking that. And I'm like, yes. We have to take this. It's so fun. We can't even afford a tandem bike. And Greg was like, we can't even afford to fix that, whatever it is. We're not doing this. No, he told me. And I was like, just put it in the back of the truck and take it to the bike store. Just take it to the bike store and see. Let's just see what happens. And so we argue about it that whole night. But sure enough, the next day he takes it to the bike shop. And then we, he comes home with it that night and he's like come out to come out to the van so i go out there and i'm getting ready to take the thing out and he's like don't scratch it do not scratch <laughs> it and i'm like what and he's like you have to be super careful with this and in my mind i'm like how'd you all of a sudden fall in love with the tandem bike and then he says this to me do you know how much this is worth it, it the guy would offer me two thousand dollars on the spot for this bike turns out it's a schwinn a really old schwinn bicycle that's worth a lot of money all of a sudden it became very important to Greg <laughs> when he saw it and it was so interesting that what was trash all of a sudden became treasure yeah when you had a better understanding of what was going on and that's what I love about this miracle is what other people would look at as like cast out or thrown out or set aside all of a sudden is like holding the very finest wine in the whole house and not just a little bit of it, like too much probably yeah. for the wedding, you know, a lot. Right. And I love that you're like, okay, is that what Jesus does? Does he enter stories and he sees what's cast out, what's been set aside, what's forgotten, what, what seems like the most ordinary thing. And then he touches that thing and all of a sudden it's a treasure. Yeah. And I want him to do that with me. Right. With my life. Right. Right. And show that picture of the bike. That's oh, nice, so this like... is so fun because that bike has been our family memories. And this is Caleb who was in the car seat when I drug that bike home <laughs> on his wedding night with his darling bride, Maria, holding a spring, a sparkler in her hand. 
I'm a little they, nervous about that sparkler, right? Like, I know. <laughs> like you just set so him on fun. fire. She wasn't going to miss out. Maria's personality <laughs> is not to miss out on the party. And they rode down a whole line of people holding sparklers on that tandem bike that I dragged out of the trash can. And I just love that, like, something that is looked over or forgotten can become such an integral part of life because of what he does. Right. And it makes me think too that those people kept those water pots then forever. Yes. Because they were just like, oh, yeah. as a reminder kind of yeah. of that story and of that thing. So For sure. it's cool that like he shows us that very, very first thing and, and we see it with water pots and we see it at the sweating and we see it, you know, with the water turned to wine. And then it's almost as if the story keeps going and it says, now watch it with people. Yes. Watch this same, this is what he came to do, right? Yeah, he came, and he came to, to do it for one person at a time, right. the mom at the wedding. And right. then it's going to be, you know, the man in the dark of the night. And you just love that he's like, there's, there's a process to what I'm doing here. And it generally has to do with one person. At a time. Yeah. Um, let me say on a, a side note too, as we look at, because we're going to meet this man, Nicodemus right here for a second, but um, some people were asking questions about, oh, how, did, how does the journal work? Like with the lesson and stuff like that. Um, this is how we kind of hope that you'll use it. There's all these notes to kind of write the things that you're learning as you read and in Sunday school and as you listen to this or other podcasts. And then every day, there is kind of like a reflection question that you can go back to and kind of just like remember the lesson and think about how it, you kind of see it showing yeah. up in your own life. I just remembered somebody asked that. So I wanted to... And they'll, each of these questions will generally go with one of the episodes. So when you watch episode one, go to question one. When you watch episode two, you might go to sec or question number two. We generally will teach that way. Not always, always but most of the time. Yeah. We'll teach that way. So I was saying that because when we meet Nicodemus here um, in this John chapter three, we asked these three questions about him and then the woman at the well we're going to meet in the next segment is what did they know? What were they asking? And then what did they learn from that conversation? And right at the beginning of chapter three, you find out that here's Nicodemus and he's a ruler of the, the Pharisees, right? He's this leader in that community. And he comes to Jesus by night, it says in verse two. And we don't necessarily know why, um, whether he's trying to like, you know, not let his buddies know what's going on, or maybe it's the only time he's available. I don't know. But it kind of, it's interesting that he comes to him under the cover of darkness, right? And, and is going to have this conversation with him. And in verse two, he comes to him and he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no one can do these miracles except God be with him. And you could almost hear the questioning in his voice where he's just like, listen, tradition says you shouldn't be. I, we can't figure you out is what's kind of going on. But one thing we know is that you are a, a teacher come from God. And that's actually our word for the week. Um, yeah, our, our name, it. our name of Jesus for this week is um, rabbi, and it's the, it's the phrase that Nicodemus uses with him. Um, and it comes out of that verse, John 3, 2, right there, where he starts out. And I love that there is like that moment of respect. Yeah. Like, I don't know a lot, but I know enough to address you as rabbi. Right. Which I love that Nicodemus is, there's something in him, there's awe, there's wonder, there's respect, there's that like that honor that he's going to bring into the situation. And as a leader himself, it's interesting that he comes and he calls him that. And like to call someone teacher, rabbi means a teacher or a leader or a mentor. And he's like, I need you to show me something. I need you to, I need you to mentor and teach me and kind of move me along um, in this. And um, Jesus then begun, begins to teach him, right? And he starts to teach him. And this the whole conversation is so... Um, interesting and, and, and powerful. And he starts with that line in verse three, except, let me teach you something. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus, bless his heart, is like, how can a man be born when he's old? Does he go into the <laughs> womb a second time? <laughs> and Jesus is like, oh, sweet Nicodemus. Um, verse five, except they be born of water and of the spirit, they cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
of God. And he starts to teach him about the spirit moving and like, like a wind and what it means to see the kingdom of God and just, and all of these things. And he starts to teach him using the scripture that we find in the book of Numbers, something that he would have been familiar with. He's like, do you remember the story of, um, of the people in the wilderness and the snakes came and they bit them and they were poisoned and they had all of these, these problems. And then the Lord gave a solution and he lifted up this brass serpent on a, on a stick and lifted it up. And whosoever would look at that, you know, would be cured and healed from, you know, the poison that, that they had. And, and we know what Nephi teaches about that, but because it was so simple, because it was so easy, right? they didn't do it. They didn't enter into the relationship. And you love that Nicodemus being a Pharisee is going to be so caught up in the 613 rules. And this is how it looks. And this is how it reads. And this is what it is. And Jesus is like, do you know how the wind works? Like you might need to start thinking in a little bit different way. Right. Or, or you will never see the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. If you're caught up in the law and the structure and the rules and all of those things, you actually might miss the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. And and I love that he just, when he says, when he gives him that, talking about that being born again, for Nicodemus, the family you're born into is really important. It was like, I'm a part of the family of Abraham. We're a part of the chosen people. Yeah. So isn't that interesting that he just says, no, that actually won't matter as much. Because he says, in the story, whosoever looked um, was healed. Yeah. And he's kind of breaking that open right here. And he says, whosoever, this is for you, the priest, and also for the, the pauper. You know, it's for yeah. anybody and everybody. Right, and for the Jews, but it's also going to be for the Gentiles, which right. that would have been really hard to hear as leadership of the Jewish family, you know, that you were like, no, yeah. no, no, this is meant to be ours. And so it, it kind of is that thing where like, if you want to see the kingdom, you're going to have to break out of yeah. this mold. Open the window. Yeah. Let the wind in. Yes. And let it rustle all your papers, yes. you know, around yes. like everything that you have in order. And I love that Nicodemus will probably leave with more questions that he came with, right? He's just going to be like, I... I'm trying to figure you out and I haven't quite yet, but I do love that he's going to leave with this where Jesus teaches him starting in 14, just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then that famous verse, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then there's something in that verse 17, that kind of is the capstone to this thing, that, a couple things to teach where it says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through, but that the world through him might be saved. And it's so interesting to me because it really does feel like he's trying to shake up Nicodemus's belief system right like he he really is like it's almost like riddle me this riddle me that you know where he's like you had to be born again and nicodemus is like what and then he's like you cannot be so tied to the structure let the wind in and he's like what you know and yeah. then he gets to the point where he's like god is not um come into the world to condemn but you think about the pharisees he's like no wait my job is to judge my right. job is to set the rule. My job is to look at people and say, what can they do? And I love when he's like, well, I actually was sent from heaven. And my job is actually not to condemn, but to save. Yeah. So how are you doing in that, Nicodemus? You know, what, what's, what does your heart look like? And I'm so fascinated by those two words in 17, condemn or be saved. And if you look up condemn, the Greek translation of that word condemn would be krino, which means to punish, to damn, to call into question, or to judge. And it's so interesting because what will the Pharisees do to Jesus? All those. 
Yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of the world they live in, to punish, to damn, to call into question, to judge. And and I love that Jesus is like, that's actually not very God-like, you know? Yeah, yeah. That actually isn't what I came to do. I came, the word um, that he uses is to save, or the Greek word would be sozo, which means to deliver, protect, heal, preserve, and make whole. And I love this thought that he's like, don't be confused about who God is or what he came to do. Because that could confuse you. Yeah. And, and that might make this hard to see the kingdom if you don't understand what like my mission is. My mission is to deliver, protect, heal, preserve, and make whole. Now, there is a world where there is judgment and there is also mercy, right? You can't, you can't take that out of the story, but I love what Jesus teaches here, which is this. He that believes is going to experience this. And he does tell us, he that does not believe, um, it says in verse 18, but he that believeth not is condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, but they will love darkness more than light. And so this is a choice. He's not telling you this is not a choice. This is a choice. If you choose not to believe in Jesus, he tells Nicodemus, in me, in what I came to do, you can choose this. Yeah. But I actually came to do this. And that's what I need you to see. And it's, I think it's awesome that he uses that story of the serpents yes. in the wilderness because it's like, listen, the, the problem is the snakes, right? And they're poisoned. All of you are poisoned. And I came to rescue you and save you and heal you. Like I came, like my mission was a healing, delivering mission, yes. not this. Yes. The, like the snakes are punishing and damaging yes. you is the problem. And I came to deliver and protect you and heal you from them. But like you have to choose that and you have to look to me. And, and I love that he uses that, that phrase. And I think this will make more sense when we get to the fourth segment. Yeah. Like, uh, but I want to show it right here where he says, but whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I think we're going to see this in the fourth section a little bit better, but usually those words are used as like end day words. Like in the end, I will perish or yeah. in the end, I will have eternal life. But I like that Jesus is using that darkness and light where he's just like, no, no, the second you begin to believe, life light. and light can come in right now yeah. and start to make a change. That's so good. Right? Yeah. Um, really, really cool story with um, Nicodemus. And especially because he is this like leader of this like really rigid system. And Jesus comes in and just kind of like, hold on. And a system that dis that said who could be saved and who couldn't be saved. And he kind of opens that up, the door wide open. And he says, no, at whosoever yes. believes. Well, and I love that like what he's asking is, is God with you? And how can those things be? And show me the heavenly things. And I love that Jesus is like, okay, believe. Yeah. And you will see all of those things. Right, right. In you and in other people. Yes. Too, right? Yeah. Which this next story in John chapter three would have just shaken Nicodemus <laughs> to the core, right? If he would have been a witness to this John chapter three, it would have been just nuts, you know, for him, because there, there is this woman that we meet in John chapter four and uh, we call her the woman at the well and she lives in this place called Samaria, which is, which ever since, um, remember last year, Nehemiah and Ezra came back to rebuild the temple. Ever since then, there has been a feud with the Samaritans and Galilee's up here and Jerusalem's down here. And in between those two places is this land called Samaria. And you've heard this before that sometimes people would walk extra days not to even like step foot in that part of the land because they had a major feud, religious, moral, everything with Samaritans, right? And Jesus, I love that line that he says yeah. in verse 4, 4, 4, John 4, 4, it says, he must needs go through Samaria. Like there's something here that must be done. And along those same lines, I think it's so important because he comes to the city of Samaria, it tells us in five, 
and um, to this piece of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph and Jacob's well was there. And one thing that's interesting if you study the culture of Jerusalem is there would have been two wells in Samaria. One was called Ain Askar, I think, if I'm remembering right, which is where everybody else would go to get their water. And also it's important to note, you would go get your water in the morning. It was so hot. All the women would go get their water in the morning. So there's a little interesting thing that happens in verse six when it says, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So he's at this unused well that nobody comes to in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. And now this woman is going to come, not at the time when you get water, and also not to the well where everyone else goes. And what I love is not only has Jesus gone to the city of outcasts, but now he's gone to the one who is the most outcast in the whole city, who can't even use the well everyone else goes right, to right. and won't even go at the time when everyone else goes because she's so ashamed of her life and her story and her situation that she goes at the time when she knows nobody will be there to the well nobody will be at. And when you read then he must needs go to Samaria, I love that he's like, I will go to the outcast of the outcasts. Yeah. I must needs go there. Right. To that place. Yeah. But you just love him double for that. Yeah. And and you learn a little bit about her story when he gets there as he comes and, and you find he asks for a drink of water from her, which would have been like, you just didn't do that. And she actually says it. She's like, wait, why are you a Jew even asking me for some water? Like we don't do that. Well, and like, also let's tell the story because there is a hospitality code. So let's add this into the story where in those days, in those times, and in all of those cities, there is this code, the hospitality code, which is if someone asks you for water, you do not refuse it. You just don't. That is the rule. But what the lady's helping us to understand is there's actually a higher rule, which is the Jews wouldn't ask anything from a, an outcast, from a Samaritan, even water. So the hospitality code actually doesn't apply here is what the lady is teaching him. Like, that's not true. I know what the hospitality code is, but you as a Jewish man should not be asking anything from me, which is so interesting that he's like, that he's crossing over every border, right? The, right, the right. Jews to the outcasts, but then even the hospitality code isn't going to work here. Like she's like, let me keep reminding you who I am. Yeah. Like, do you know who I am? Because yeah. you actually don't want to be talking to me. And also you shouldn't ask any, if you knew who I was is kind of what she's insinuating. Yeah. And kind of like with Nicodemus, like you just, it's such a, it's such a clever conversation. Yes. Right. Where, where he just is breaking down all those barriers and, and, and she's just like, we don't do that. And then he answers in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who asked you, give me to drink, you actually would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. Now, living water, they she would have heard is like running water, like a stream or a waterfall or something like and that. Clean. And clean, yeah, so clean, right? And and she's just like, sir, you don't even have a like a bucket. Like, what water would you could you possibly give me? You know, like I just love that he's just, yeah. you know, and and are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this this well, you know? And then he starts teaching her, if you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. Um, but the water I will give you will be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And she's just like, sir, please give me that water, <laughs> you know, so that I don't have to come here in the afternoon every day, avoiding the gossip of the town. Like I keep having to come back here to this place again. It, it gives you this like sense of her like shame and monotony of yeah. her life. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I don't want to do that anymore. Like almost like she's like, oh, if only you had something like that, like this wishful, like out loud. Yeah. And he says this now, now he's going to, you know, okay, go get your husband and tell him to hear. And she's like, I don't have a husband. This is verse 17. 
And he says, oh, that's interesting because you've actually had five. And the one that you're with right now, living with, is actually not your husband. So it's interesting you said that. And she's like, in verse 19, <laughs> sir, <laughs> I perceive that you are a prophet, you know? And now it's kind of like, oh my gosh, like, wait, how did you... How did you know this? And then she like changes the subject because she's like, I actually don't want to talk about that. Yeah. Like I have a lot of painful memories and that's really weird that you know that. And you know, and yeah. she's just like. And there are places I'm not going to let you go. Right. Right. And yeah. then she's like, you know how like you Jews say the holy mountain in Jerusalem is the place and we say it's this mountain. Isn't that interesting? That Like, which one is it? <laughs> well, and I love too that <laughs> what precedes that moment is he does the same thing he does with Nicodemus. Like there's that moment with Nicodemus, which he's like, Nicodemus, this is what I came to do, to save, yeah, to deliver, to protect, to heal, to make whole, you know? And he's like, all I need from you, Nicodemus, is for you to believe that that's what I came to do. Yeah. And I love that he gives that same invitation in 21 where he's like, woman, believe me. And I love that he uses that word woman, because if you look in scripture, if you research in scripture, one thing that you will learn is... To use the word woman is a, a sign of deep respect. Right. And I love that he's like addresses her like with deep respect. That he's like, woman, believe me. And then she's like, but this is what I've been taught to believe. Yeah. Is, is this. That like you, you think this and we think this. Like believing is not, that's a barrier for you and me actually. Yeah. And I think it's really awesome that he uses that term of respect and honor after she knows he knows about the five, six husbands. Yes. You know? Yes. Like, it's like, wait, you may have said that to me because your mama taught you good manners, but it's really intriguing and must be like, a, like sort of like disarming to her that you're like, wait, you actually know about everything. You know about everything and you still are speaking to me. With respect. Yeah. With respect and in that way. And, and it's interesting that she goes, you know, to that issue of like, well, you say this and, and, and I say this and it's almost like who's right? Someone's got to be right yeah. and someone's got to be wrong and, you know, and, and, and all of these things. And, and he uses that line, which I really love in 24 and the Joseph Smith translation changes it, but he said, you know, God is a spirit um, and it's changed to for unto such hath God promised his spirit. But I love that he's using that word spirit again, because spirit and wind are the same they come from the same, they can yeah. translate from the same yeah. word. It's cool that Nicodemus yes. says like, listen, things are not as like, you know, you, the kingdom to Nicodemus is, is not all about the rigid Law. rules and laws. It's the wind. It's not all about which mountain and that mountain and who's yeah. right and wrong. He's well, like, and your five husbands yeah. and the one you live with now. It's yes. like, that's not what I came to talk to you about. I came to talk to you about belief and living water and like, being able to to heal and deliver yes, yes. and you love that she's like okay here's the one thing i believe in 25 there will be a messiah who comes which is called christ and when he comes he will tell us all things and i love like i have thought that same thing is this doesn't make sense to me my life doesn't make sense to me and i don't know what happened with the first and then the second and somehow now i've gotten my i just I don't know what happened or where I went wrong or what, why is this my story? Why is this the life I'm living out? Like I can hear her just saying, I need him to come and tell me all of this is going to be okay. And all of this is going to resolve. Yeah. And there is a way out of this. Like when I think of her saying, he's going to come and tell us all things. I almost hear her saying, I need him to explain why did my life turn out like this? Yeah. Why is this my story? Why am I living every day coming to this well and I have no friends and I have nothing? Yeah. I need him to come and tell me that. And, and it's also cool that, you know, he, she, but because for her, she's like, I can't actually go to the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Yeah. And I can't go to the holy mountain here because I'm, I'm not, I'm not I'm welcome. Outcast. I'm an outcast here. And so when he introduces this idea, it's just like, what if, what if you didn't, you know, yeah. need those? What if it came to you? Yeah. You know, I almost hear in her also say when she's like, oh, he'll tell us all things, like a yearning too, where just like, oh, almost like, oh, I wish I could believe what you're saying. Yes. But 
you're just a man Who on needs the a road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, the Messiah is going to come someday and, and he's really going to clear this and explain it. And fix it. And then in 26, um, this is remarkable because it's the very first time that he publicly says who he is. To a uh, woman who is at an a, outcast. At an outcast in well. In Samaria. In the middle like, of the afternoon. She's the least in a Pharisee's mind worthy for the declaration. Right. And right. I love that the first written um, record that we have that Jesus is the Messiah comes to her. Yeah. In her rags. Yes. At the well. Yes. You know, um, with, with her five plus husbands. Which, you which know. lets you know, like it just helps you realize that Jesus maybe has a different idea of worthy. A different idea of uh, like who's ready to hear his message. And he also had a different idea of a woman's place yeah. in the plan, yeah. in the larger plan. Because back then, a woman's witness would have meant nothing. Yeah. And yet he's like, oh, I choose you to be the first person that I tell of who I am and what I'm doing here. Yeah. And what my mission is. And all of a sudden in your mind, you're like, wait, do I? Like, do I understand? Do I see the kingdom? Because this is not who I would have picked. Yeah. Probably. And it's really cool that it's exactly what he promised Nathaniel was going to happen. And to Nicodemus. Yeah. You know, you will see the kingdom. You're watching. Remember, it was that image of the ladder. Yes. You know, and everything that he said to Nathaniel. And it's like, you're watching it. You're watching heaven come down. You're watching like the miracles happening. Yeah. It's happening right here at this well. You know, you maybe thought it was supposed to happen at one of the holy mountains. Yeah. And it does, you know, but, it, but, but it's happening right here. But this is kingdom work. Here, yes, this right? This is kingdom work. You're seeing the kingdom happen right here. You're seeing yeah. the thrift shop miracle happen, you know, at, at the right. well and on the roof and in the dark. And, yes. You know, and that, that's really cool. If you look at the footnote in verse 26 where he says, I am he that speaketh to thee, it will tell you that the Greek of that is he uses that phrase, I am which is that holy name of, of, of Jesus from the Old Testament, right? Jehovah. I am who I will always be. I am what tomorrow demands. Like I, I, here, like I am shouldn't be sitting at the well in the outcast well in the middle of the afternoon, but I am. Yes. And, and I do love, and maybe this will get us into that next fourth section, is that idea of she said, one day the Messiah will come. And he didn't say to her, I will be that. He said in present, I am he. It's happening. Yes. And, and that idea of Nicodemus, eternal life. Or, and it's just like, what if it's happening now. right now? Yeah, which I love. And so something awesome happens here. And it's one of our favorite parts of this story. And if you don't have it marked in your scriptures, you might want to in verse 28, because it says, the woman then left her water pot and went into the city. And... I love this because what did she come for that day? She, she came for water. Like the, her water pot and filling that water pot was her most important task of the day. And I love that he meets her in that ordinary work. That he's like, I know you do this every day. I know you'll be at the well at noon. I've watched you. I know how things go. Um, but I love that in this moment, she leaves behind the water pot. And I think that's an important lesson that is pointed out here is there was something about him that was a greater call to her livelihood than the water was Yeah, in that moment. Makes you think about the times that something's so exciting that you skip lunch for it. Yes. You know, it's like, there's not many things that make me want to skip lunch. <laughs> yes. But like, wait, what is it that you're, that you're so like... Yes. Into that you forgot why you came in the first place. Yeah. So she goes, she goes out to tell everyone in the city, this is what has happened. And then there's this really great set of verses that starts in 31. It starts out like this in the meanwhile. And I just love that thought. Like in the meantime, while all that is happening in the meantime, he's still at the well, right? He's just sitting there. And now the apostles have come and they're like, what are we doing here? Exactly. And, and, and it's why funny are you that talking it says, to her? Yeah, yeah, it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> they just start eating and it says that line, like, that he was like, none of them asked, like, you know, where is that? Oh, in 27. And they all came and marveled 
that he was talking to that woman, but nobody like voiced it. They were like, this is weird. What? Yeah, why is he talking to her? <laughs> What's happening right now? And so then I love it. So she runs off. She's so happy. And in the meanwhile, they say to him, you need to eat. And he's like, no, I actually have something more fulfilling, sustaining um, than meat. I mean, I, I'm sure he ate lunch, but he's like, I right now am like caught up in something bigger than the sandwich you just brought me. You need to know that. And there must have been a moment when he like then looks you, up. There's that line in 33 where they're yes. like, wait, did someone else bring him a sandwich? <laughs> like, why? <laughs> What's he is talking so about? Like, yes. isn't that awesome? And it just kind of shows you like, isn't it, we keep seeing this happen again and again and again. Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? Yes. You know, and, and the woman at the well is like, switching you know the I subject. Am? Because she's yes. like, what? And now the disciples are like, and I think that is so awesome because it's almost like he's saying like, you haven't, none of you have seen the kingdom yet. Yes. You're so used to like, it's rules that do it. Um, my past disqualifies me. Yes. Uh, like, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's cool that everyone's yes. like, wait, what, what's he, happening? And he's kind of shaking things up a little bit. And he, and we get into this thing where he's like, okay, in the meantime, his disciples pray him. They want to know if he eat, if he's going to eat. Then they want to know if someone else delivered lunch. As if there's DoorDash in the <laughs> middle of the wilderness. Who was going to bring him lunch? And then he says, I have a different agenda right now in verse 34. But then in 35, there must have been a moment when he looks up over the fields. And if you've ever been to Israel, you know this is true. A lot of the land is farmland. And one of the things they grow the most over there is wheat. So it would be common uh, like you would think to yourself it, that there might have been wheat right there where he was. And he looks out. Everybody knows when the harvest is. And Jesus alludes to it. He's like, you say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest is what he says to him. So he, they would have known. This is how long. This is the process of growing wheat. Everybody knows it. Everybody grows it. But I love when he says this in the meanwhile. He says, don't say this anymore. There are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. And I think to myself, how many times do I live in yet mm. in the meantime? How often am I like, well, in four months, this will happen. And then I will be happy. And then I will have my reward. And then like you're living in yet. You're living in that thing. And he's like, I'm going to say this to you right now. Lift up your eyes and look, right? Remember what he said to Nicodemus, see the kingdom, like lift up your eyes and look. And I love when he says this, look on the fields for they are white already. Like I sometimes wished it would pause right there where he's like, th there is an already happening right in front of your eyes. It's all ready to harvest. You don't have to wait for four months to see the kingdom work. It's happening already. Yeah. It's right now. And it makes me think to myself, I want to learn to live in the already. Yeah. You know, in the meantime of my life, I want to learn how to live in the already moments, in those moments. And I think it's so interesting because he comes to these people in all of them. Like, let's just think, what's similar about all of them. And how many times have you experienced this? Because the, it took place in the back room of a wedding, in the dark of the night, at the well of the outcasts. That's where Jesus is showing up into people's stories. Like he's meeting them where they are as they are. That's where he's coming. Yeah, and, and it's different than... It's different than the four months, right? And it's not because like the woman says, one day this will all get worked yes. out. And and there are things that will be worked out. And Nicodemus says, maybe thinks like, oh, yeah. you know, everlasting life is, is happening in the future. But like Jesus is coming into all these places to say, no, no, no. I actually show up yeah. in the meanwhile. Yes. Right? And this word that we were talking, you know, already doesn't mean A-L-L -L space ready. Because that woman, you would say she's not, she would say, I, I, I'm not ready yeah. yet. I got to pull things together first. She's like, no. It's already. It's already happening. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The work I'm doing 
begins now. Yeah. At lunchtime. With a conversation. Yes. This is how it begins. And you love that he's going to meet them in those places. That's what he came to do. Um, and I love that in this story, we're going to see in all of them, two types of grace. The first type of grace we've talked about already, he came to save. It's saving grace. That's what he came to do. And remember, saving grace means he came to heal and to protect and to deliver and to preserve and to make whole. That's what he came to do. That's saving grace. And I love that that's the kind of grace that comes into a back room of a wedding or in the dark of a night, or it comes at the well of the outcast. It's when he like shows up into a story and says, okay, Lift up your eyes. Yes, and look. And believe. Yeah, Yeah, and and believe. And look how cool this is that I just noticed right now. Sorry, if you're on the podcast, we don't know what you're supposed to do. Um, But in this verse 34, look at that. Yes. My my work, my, what I'm here is to do the will of him that sent me, which is John 3, 16. But then look, and to then finish his work too. Like there's both of those happening in that verse. I came to do his will, which is he sent me to save. Yeah. And I also yes, came to finish, to finish the work. his work. And we talked about earlier um, that he was a carpenter. And I don't know if you know about this or not, but one of the most prestigious types of carpenter is one who does finish work. They're actually called a Finnish carpenter. And I love that he's like, he knows what it is to do the last 3%. He knows that those last things that you do to just complete a project. And so I love that he's like, I'll come meet you in that space. I'll do the will. I'll meet you in the back room of the wedding or in the dark of the night or at the well of the outcast. But I don't plan to leave you there. Yeah. Right. You know, it might have been God's will for me to meet you here, but I also came to finish right. what I started yeah. here. Nicodemus, I'm going to finish what we started here tonight. And for this woman at the well, I came to finish what we started here. And he also came to lift you out of those places. And I love that. It's just like what he was saying to Nicodemus. I came to be lifted up. And why did I do that? So I could lift you up. That's why I came to do that. And we start learning these really extraordinary lessons about grace in all three of these stories. And so that's where we kind of want to end today is what does his grace look like and what does it do for someone? And how do we find ourselves? um, I don't know if you are a thrift shop shopper. Are you? I don't even know this about you. Oh, nope. Amazon. Okay, me. I love thrift shops. I love them. Like my heart is drawn to a thrift shop. And it's because I think it's partly because I love the idea of second chances. I just I love the idea of a second chance. And so I and love I the love thought the of the day of a two day delivery. Yes, you do. <laughs> and I love this thought of when I walk in there, I immediately start going through and thinking, where would this find a second chance? life or a a second part of its story. And don't you want to think that Jesus just walks in with that same, like I've got some really great thrift shop finds in this house. And if we had an extra hour, I would walk you around my house and show you (laughs) all of them. You saw the tandem bike, but what about the red coat in my closet or the whole new thing of silverware that I found and Greg polished up for me. And I or just, the castle door table that I just <gasps> found out. Yeah, what old. about my coffee table is an old castle door, a real life castle. <laughs> just found that out. I've seen that again and again, and it's so crazy. Yeah, because there's a hole in the wood where the handle was supposed to be, and it's gigantic. And I just love this thought of like um, him coming into a story where we think we are cast out or secondhand or forgotten or overlooked. And what's he going to do in a life? And that's grace for me. That's what grace is. Mm. And so I want to just think as we're ending up about this chart. Which is such a cool line. And I want to just say, make sure no one missed it. Okay, say it again. You know, it's like grace is what he's going to do in a life. Yes. You know, that's what you can like anticipate and expect. It's what he promised Nathaniel when he said, you know, you will see greater things than these 
not at the end, yes, but throughout. Yes. You're going to see them throughout. Yeah. And if you're listening on the podcast, this is a time where you actually might want to either get in your journal because this is going to be the worksheet for the journal this week. So if you are a podcast listener and you have a journal, you're just going to be able to walk through this with your journal. If you don't have a journal, you're going to actually might want to go to YouTube or you can print off this worksheet from the newsletter or it's in the app. Um, you can just print it right off. So, And all these PS filled out are always in the app. Anything you see up on the board, the scriptures on the board are always in the app yeah, too. For always in the app. For any help that you need if you don't want a screenshot. And but. if you're wanting to teach a really similar lesson like what we just did, this whole PowerPoint is also in the app. Just You just can download it and use. So this is what I love to call the grace chart. And the reason why I love it is because it teaches those two sides of grace that sometimes grace feels like so hard to grasp hold of because we're not quite sure how it works. And I love in these stories, we a little bit get to watch how it works. Like what does it actually look like? So there's a couple things you have to know going in. One is we were in God's presence before we came here. And we also hope to go back there. Like that innately in all of us is this hope that we would somehow get back to God. But meanwhile, we came down to mortality. And it's so interesting because we actually use words like this, which I didn't think about, but cast out, mm -hmm. right? It, it's like uh, we came to the thrift shop, everyone. To the well, yeah. to the dark. <laughs> the well, to the dark. Yeah. Where this yeah. is the place where we are is we're, we're kind of cast out. And um, you might think to yourself, well, now I'm in this place, I, may, I might be in the thrift shop forever, right? But God's like, no, I have a better plan for you. And that's going to require actually someone to come down here to meet you at the well of the outcast, to meet you in the dark of the night, to meet you in the corner of the back room. He's like, I will send someone to find you. And that's there. why six, the John 3, 16 is such a, that word sent is such a neat word. And it yes. comes in 17 again, for God so loved the world that he sent, you yes. know, that like he didn't like, um, he didn't, that God so loved the world that he waited for you to come back, to come back at some but point like, and hoped you'd make it. Yeah. But he's like, he, God so loved the world that he took the, he took it in his own hands and he sent, you know, yeah. his son, which I love. And we call that condescension. That is a word we use for that. Um, you'll remember it means for God to come down to your level. Um, so that's what happens. We call that condescension. An easier way to describe it, I think, because that's a hard word to say, is he sent Jesus to meet you where you are as you are. That's what he sent. He was like, could you go down into the dark night? Could you go down to the well of the outcast? Could you actually go into the back room of this wedding? Because this mom is going to be freaking out. Yeah. And somebody is going to need to enter that story and intervene in that story. And that's beautiful that that happens. Um, this saving, right? Him coming into this place. And the word that we would use for this saving grace, the sozo that's happening, are those words that we talked about where what, what do you experience from him coming down, from him being sent into your story? You experience that he would deliver you and protect you and heal you and preserve you and make you whole. But and, and it's cool too that like the analogy that he uses with Nicodemus to teach this is born again. Um, because Nicodemus is so used to well, I have to do this, 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 613, yeah. right? And Jesus is like, no, no, no. It's like being born. You don't actually do anything. Yes. You know, no one congratulates the baby, yes. right? Like someone is going to labor for you to be born, yes. right? That is what's actually going to happen. Like yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm Jesus, like I'm going to come in. And do your that story. And into your story. And I, you know, I'll do the I'll labor. I'll do the labor. I'll preserve you. Right. I'll deliver you. Right. right. I will do all of that. I will save you. That's what I came to do. But this, that's actually not enough. And I think sometimes we forget that, that Jesus will meet us where we are as we are, but he doesn't intend to leave us there. 
Yeah, he's going to finish. Like, yeah, the work. you love that he like came down here. But what if we all just stayed down here together? I mean, we love if Jesus was down here forever, but that wasn't the full plan, right? God wants us back. He wants us back. And Jesus told Nicodemus, I came to be lifted up, right? Just like Moses lifted up the staff, I came to be lifted up. Oh, I touched the board. You're fine. Um, I came to be lifted up so I could lift others up. And we actually call that ascension. Um, which is he wants to lift you to where he is as he is. And there is a process of work that takes place for that to be true, a becoming, right? A transformation, an increase of capacity. That's going to require him to finish the work that the father started in us well, when and, he sent us down. And, and to, to do what he did in John 2 which is to turn water into the finest wine, yes. right? Like that's what that exalting grace yep. looks like. It's and like, that would I was, be the word Right, I was that. this, yes. you know, it's the change, but yep. it's, not a, it's not a change from, you know, this to this, but a change from, an ele, it's an elevating change. Yes. And the fancy word for that is right? exalting, is, right. right? To take you higher. Um, we might use words where this is going to be words, saving grace is words that are deliver and, and heal and make whole, words that might explain exalting grace is to transform you or to help you to become something. That's finish work, right? That's the finish work that is happening in us. And that is also grace. He's doing for us what we're not capable of doing on our own. I right. can't deliver myself. I can't save myself. And there are wounds within me that I also cannot heal by myself, but he can. And I also love that he says, but that's not enough. Like that's not sufficient. I, I have more for you because I see your greatest capacity. Yeah. I see the mother you could be, the spouse you could be. I see um, where you could be in your calling or with your mission or um, even like that work you feel called to do, I see your greatest capacity yeah. in that. And I can make you to become that. It was so cute. One of my seminary kids today, I was having them go through and look at scriptures. And we were in that one in Mark where he says, I will make you to become. And I had a list of different scriptures they could look at. And I was like, which one is your favorite? Which one calls to you? And this darling girl in my class raised her hand and she's like, I love I will make you to become. Mm. And I was like, why? Why do you love that? And it was so cute. Her eyes just lit up and she's got this gigantic smile. It's just so big. And she just smiled as big as she could. And she said, I don't know, but it's something about the possibility. Mm. And I was like, oh, don't you want it? Like that's living right here. There's something about the possibility. Yeah, and I, I feel like in Nicodemus' story, you don't quite see it. Like you get this part in yes. his story, you know, and a promise to him and he leaves. But then at the end of the book of John, you actually do get to see it. You see a more courageous Nicodemus. You yeah. see that that's happened. But Wait, tell people why, because people might not have put oh, that connect. Oh, oh, um, toward the end of the, the story, you watch Nicodemus defend. So he's not just coming in the dead of night anymore. Now he's defending Jesus. And then now he honors him and he, he's the one who prepares his body for burial and pays for it and everything. And so you actually, the whole book of John, you see that happen, you know, with Nicodemus. But I actually think it's cool in the woman at the well story that you begin to see it already yes. in her story. And, and I, I think you just used the word already. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. because it's cool that there she is and they're having this conversation and then I actually wrote in like my little note in my scriptures this morning, when she runs off to the city to go tell everybody, I wrote, oh, she's becoming wine. Mm. Like, like all of a sudden, like you see a change happening. Yes. And she dares her. to go. Right. Like, to she's, the people she's she different. would never have been with. Right. She's different. Right. The finishing work is beginning in her. She's like, you see this elevating of, you know, of, he came to her at the well. 
and began to heal the wounds of what's happened in her past. But then yeah. now all of, you, all of a sudden you see she becomes, she actually becomes like the missionary, the greatest missionary for all of Samaria. Yes. Is what she, is what he makes her to become. And then he has to tell the disciples, hey, <laughs> stop worrying about your Subway sandwich. And what you need to see is it's happening. Yeah. Like it's, all, look at her. It's already, this is already happening. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. The greatest substance of the day is this woman and her change and yeah. what she's about to do and bring back. Yeah, I love that part so much. And I just think there's so much here for each of us who has ever felt in that space of the outcast or forgotten or looked over or set aside, you know, or cast off that you're just like, oh no, he has greater things in store for you. If that's where you are right now, just believe. Yeah. Because there's greater things. And I just have thought about this for the first time that you have a Nicodemus who probably thinks at the beginning of his story, I'm actually better than everybody. Yes. And Jesus is like, I can I can work with people who think they're better than everyone. <laughs> and then the woman who thinks I'm not even worthy to go to everybody's well. I'm yeah. worse than and it's cool that those two stories next to each other is like it shows that yeah. I can turn water to wine in whatever your story yeah. looks like. And it might take a long time. And, you know? It will. And I, I want to think again time, about right? that tandem bike that I pulled out when Caleb was one years old. That, you know, who would have thought 24 years later that bike was going to go down a long line of sparklers in a parade of, you know, that, yeah. that, like that's what you have to look forward to. Right. A sparkler parade is in your future because he can see the possibility in the trash can. Yeah. And it's, and, and it starts happening today yeah. already. Yeah. Happening. Already. So good. Hey, see you next week.